So throughout this series, we've been talking about that we worship a God who encounters. He's the ultimate bridge builder. For God so loved the world, he sent his one and only son, that our God is a God who encounters. He's not a distant, far off, uninterested God, but a God who sees, a God who loves, and a God who comes to us, whatever it might be that we're going through. And today we're talking about God encountering us in our fears. As I said earlier in worship, as we live our life, we'll be operating in two very different realities. There's one reality we can see with our eyes, and there's another reality we believe through eyes of faith. One reality is the reality of this broken, fallen world and all the things that come with it. That we live with bodies that are susceptible to illness and being hurt. Our minds, the things we see, we look out in the world and we see what's happening. True, and that can leave you with fear. And at the same time, there is a reality that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. That he is seated on the throne of power. Now one day Jesus is going to return and he's going to bring that reality which is going to squash that reality and now only the reality of Jesus will be. But until that day, we sort of, we wrestle between them. And it's important to have that understanding as we walk through this topic and to have that understanding as you go out into your life of knowing how do I grasp with the things I'm feeling and what I'm going through. So briefly, let's talk about fear. Fear is a byproduct of the fall. Fear came after Genesis 3. Uh, Adam and Eve, first humanity, perfect humans, they don't fear. Fear has to do with a threat of physical harm or emotional harm or psychological harm. And in the kingdom of God, there is no more threat. So there will be a day when you're with Jesus and you will no longer fear anything. That's cool, right? That is cool. But until that day, we will experience it. And as I said, some of our fears can do for us, but most of the time it's also for a loved one or people in our life. There might be things that we perceive as a physical threat, like heights, spiders, illness, something like that. There could be fears, though, that we see as more of emotional or psychological. It could be things like abandonment, isolation, the fear of failure, humiliation, shame, sadness, those sort of things. And we all live with a cer- certain baseline level of different fears. Now, In order for something to be a fear, you have to enter into a reality where that thing does pose a threat. Some of us can climb up a 10-foot ladder and we're fine. Others of us would get up there and and be shaking and nervous. Why? Because I might fall. I might die. I might get hurt. We all have different levels of things. To some people... In their reality, that is a threat. And to others, it's not. I can go sing karaoke all day. I'm up here talking to you right now. Still in the top three is fear of public speaking. Some of you right now are looking at me and go, it's not my reality. And it doesn't bother me at all. Why? What? What is it? We all have these things. I remember this time when I was was downstairs and I... I think my daughter was probably about five, but I heard this shriek. You know, the kind of, ah, like really loud. I was like, whoa, what? And I came up and I went in a room and she was on the other side of the room and she was like backed up and she goes, and there was a spider this big and it had scurried on the floor and it was in between her and the door. So she could not get past it. She was terrified. And I came in the room and I was like, what? That? I go, why are you afraid of this? I go, you're way bigger than it. And she's like, oh, it could bite me or something. And I go, no, not this one. And me as the macho dad, I go, check this out. Right? Spiders are in my house. They're fair game. If they're outside, we don't squash them. And I'm definitely not one of those like, let's scoop it up and bring it out to its natural. Like, are you serious? Your fate was sealed when you came in my home. (laughs) Yeah. 
And I like being that macho dad sometimes. But I squashed it. In her reality, that spider was a threat. In my reality, it was a squash. I know it's a silly story, but it proves a point. The point is this. Every single fear that you have in your life is a tiny little spider compared to the power of Jesus who is with you. Whatever the fear, whatever you're worried, whatever that fear, whatever you're pointing at going, ah, whatever the thing is, is a small spider compared to the power of Jesus. In, in Christ's mind, it's not a threat. But in our mind, it is. Hence the struggle. Now my, my silly story of the spider is not from the Bible, so let's go to something a little more authoritative than that. All right? John 20. And this is a great story where we see these realities played out right in front of us in Mary Magdalene. Now, it's been three days since Mary was completely traumatized by everything that happened to Jesus. Mary witnessed this brutal torture. Brutal. You can only imagine what that would do to any of us psychologically, emotionally. She saw it happen. She saw Jesus get crucified on a cross. She heard every word of people that walked by scoffing, mocking him, all the things. She saw it all play out, and then she watched him get put in the tomb. Mary is devastated. She is imagining now what is life going to be like without Jesus? Because with Jesus came a lot of hopes and dreams and things that she was thinking. I'm putting all my faith into this. I mean, imagine it in your own life. How much you've put into, I mean, you're here in worship. You're engaging this. What if all of a sudden that rug was pulled out from under you and all of a sudden all the promises and all the hopes and all the dreams of Jesus are dashed? That is the, de the despair she is in. So three days later, she's coming early to the tomb. She probably had done it the other days too. And she's coming early. And this time though, she notices the stone is rolled away. And she looks in and there is no body. Again, think of this in your own life. You watched your loved one go into the ground. Tombstone, dirt, it's all there. You came back three days later to visit them and it's dug up with the casket open and the body's gone. What are you thinking? Exactly what she's thinking. Someone stole the body. She runs back, gets the disciples. John and Peter, they come running. John's a little funny. He's like, I beat Peter. But they run to the tomb. The disciples look in. They're like, yeah, no. They're bewildered, it says. They go back to the other disciples. But Mary stays. It says she's weeping outside of the tomb. She is so deep in her fear of what this means for my life now. This is her reality. Jesus is gone. My hopes are dashed. Everything is crashed around me. My reality is ruined. And she is stuck. She's so stuck that she looks in and she sees two angels. You think that might blast you out of your whatever you're in, but not for her. She sees two angels, one at the head and one at the foot of the slab of stone where the body of Jesus would have laid. Now, Side note, we're going to come back, but hang with me because this is really cool. You ready? That is what the Ark of the Covenant would have looked like roughly. It was called the mercy seat. And it was the physical thing that marked that God's presence was with his people. But you can see it would have been a slab of stone with an angel, one at the head and one at the foot. Now, I don't care what documentary you read. We're, we're, we're not going to find it. All right? Some of you right now are like, oh, I don't know. We're probably not. Even if we do find it, what's the big deal? Why? Because we don't need it. I don't need that. Why? Because there's a new one. 
Where? The empty tomb. The empty tomb is our mercy seat. It's where the mercy of God was given to us. It's what we need to know for certain God is with us and he'll always be with us because we have the empty tomb. Isn't that cool? All right. It's cool to me. Mary looks in and she sees two angels. Now, the angels inhabit a new reality. The angels know that Jesus is alive. The tomb is empty. I mean, they're in celebratory mode here. So see, they see this woman, and a logical question is, you could probably see them like glancing at each other, like, what's going on right now? And they say, woman, what are you, why are you weeping? Like, like, what on earth is there to cry about right now? I remember being at a school, with this little girl was going to have her, her birthday party, and she probably was more introverted, I don't know, but it was a surprise, and they brought in a cake, and I was going to be there and just see it. And they brought in this cake and everyone started singing. She started crying and not happy tears. Just sobbing. And it was like, what are you crying? This is a celebration for you. That's kind of where the angels are at. Like, why are you weeping? Like, what, what's going on? So she's so stuck in her reality, her fear. She's not, she's not seeing it. Then it says that Jesus himself comes up behind her. Jesus asks the same question. Woman, why are you weeping? And then I think Jesus is kind of having maybe a little bit of fun. He's one. He knows it. A little bit. Because then he says, who do you seek? Like, come on, Jesus. One, you know everything. And two, you're right outside your empty tomb. Who are you looking for? I mean, Jesus had to have had a great sense of humor. He had to have. Because that is a really funny question. Why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Like, he's like waiting for her to turn around and be like, ah. But she's so stuck. She thinks he's the gardener. Did you steal the body? See, that's what she's thinking. Because a resurrection from the dead makes no logical sense. I can't see that. I can't measure that. I don't get that. It can't be true. It's too mysterious. And that's how we approach most things when it takes faith. It's easier to believe the lie of the fear than to believe the truth. She's believing the lie. Jesus is gone. He's been stolen. I'm abandoned. He, everything's crushed. And Jesus breaks through the barrier with one word. And he says, Mary. All of a sudden, these two realities go. She turns around. Rabboni, teacher. And she goes after him and wraps her arms, clings to him, it says. Some people believe that Jesus in his resurrected state couldn't be, none of that. Jesus, again, he's being, he's being playful. He's, being, he's like, Mary, Mary, don't cling to me. Don't cling to me. I'm not going anywhere. What's her fear? I'm abandoned. I'm alone. All this hope I had in you was gone. Like, and she's like, dude, I'm not letting you go again. Three days was enough. Jesus is like, relax, relax. I'm not going anywhere. In fact, he hung around for 40 days. Relax. I'm not going anywhere, but I got a job for you. Okay? Yes, I love you. Yes, I love you. Okay, we got some, we got some things to do. All right. And then he gives a message to her to bring to the disciples that strikes at the heart of her fear. All right, let's see if you can catch it. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am sending to my Father and to my God and... Did you catch it? See, it's easy to walk right by. There's so much depth here. What is her fear? What is life going to be like without Jesus? And what does Jesus say to her? Mary, we're never going to be apart. I'm going to my father and guess what? Your father, my God, your God, my kingdom, your kingdom. Mary, it's done. We did it. 
Mary, I'm alive. The tomb is empty and it's always going to be empty and so is yours. We're never going to be apart, Mary. Don't fear, Mary. I am in control of this. I'm alive. You don't have to cling to me. I'm going to cling to you for the rest of your existence. Mary, it's done. It's finished. We did it. Celebrate. Jesus says, I am going to my Father, your Father, my God, your God. See, the moment Jesus walked out of that tomb, this brand new thing started. This brand new thing. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away, but behold, the new has come. What's the old? It's the old order of things. Sin, Satan, loss, death. What we deserve for our fallenness is the old. What's the new? The reality that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and he hands away all the blessings of that to anyone who will believe and confess he's the Lord. Or as it says in Colossians 1.18, Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. The first one of a long, long line of people who are also going to walk out of their tombs just like he did. The firstborn. The firstborn of a new reality. So that in everything, he might be preeminent. In what things of your life is Jesus preeminent in? Well, as a Christian, it would be the goal, everything. Your finances? Yep. Your job? Yep. How you raise your kids? Yep. Your marriage? Yep. Politics? Ooh, yep. Your retirement? He's got it. Your, your brain, he's got it. Heart, yep. Body, yep. Everything, Christ is preeminent because he's the firstborn. It's all on him. Everything was made by him, made through him, so that he would be first. He's the one. It's all about him. He's the only one to walk out of the tomb. I remember this story so often. It stuck with me for so long of a, of a, of a, of a, a Muslim imam, like one of their religious leaders who had converted to Christianity. And when asked, why did you convert? He said it happened to him in a dream. That he had a dream that he was walking down a path and it split in two different ways. And in one way was this man standing saying, let's go. And the other way was a man that was lying on the ground dead. And in his dream he knew that was Muhammad. And he awoke from this dream so they ask him, then why did you pick this road? He goes, I chose the alive guy. We choose the alive guy. The guy that's alive. The guy that says, I am greater than whatever it is that's going on in this world. Because at the end of the day, the greatest fear we hold is death and things related to it. Because death is loss. It's abandonment. It's despair. What will happen to my family if I'm gone? What if I lose my mind? What if something ha What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? Listen, man, I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a pastor of a lot of people. I get it. We all have the what ifs. We all have different levels of fear. Which is why Jesus knew we were going to need a helper. We needed something. Something bigger than this world. Something powerful that would hold us in this reality. Which is what he promised in John 14. Jesus said, but the helper, the Holy Spirit. The word Holy Spirit, the Greek, is actually two different words brought together. It's parakletos. And it's like a paraclete, kind of a weird word. But it's two different Greek words brought together. And uh, it means Para, which is beside, and kaleo, to call. One who is called beside you. The Holy Spirit has been called 
to be beside you, within you, as your advocate, your counselor, your comforter. Word advocate's like the one beside you in court. When you're being accused by Satan, the Holy Spirit's going, not true. Nope, not true. Yeah, that's been paid for. Yeah, Jesus died for that. Yeah, you're good. He's got that. He's got that. He's got that. To keep you from that sense of shame and guilt and despair that can come with our sin. Maybe some of you have that fear of accusation of the shame and guilt that can come from things you've done. The Holy Spirit's the advocate saying, yeah, you're you're free. That's been paid for. Yeah. The debt's been paid. It's been paid in full. It's not like Jesus paid your debt and was like, hey, you leave the tip. He didn't pay your debt and it's like, oh, it's an I owe you. You better pay me back. No, he paid the debt. Done. You're free and clear. Free and clear. How cool is that? We all, dude, there are some of you right now that live with such a long list of religious standards that you think have to be accomplished in order for God to be smiling on you. It's ridiculous. It's paid in full. Done. No religious guilt. I don't pray enough. I don't read enough. Well, it's probably true, but that doesn't keep him from smiling on you. God's not a mean principal with a big ruler slapping your hand. It's not our God. The Holy Spirit's been called into our life as our, as our comforter when we're going through times of sorrow and hard times. That one that's been called beside us to comfort us. And the Holy Spirit's been called as our counselor. The wisdom. The truth. Look what it says. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance everything I've said to you. Jesus is like, I'm not leaving you as orphans. I'm not abandoning you. But I will be with you in even greater ways than maybe the disciples experienced because I'm always with you. No matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, Jesus says, I'm there. I'm with you. I will uphold you. I will comfort you. I will be with you with my righteous right hand. I will lead you home. The byproduct of a life in the new reality is a life of peace. It's a life of contentment. You know who's in control and you know it's not you. And that's good. Because we make a mess when we try to control stuff. Especially when we try to control outcomes. This is the one that I see plaguing, especially parents, most often. You want to control the outcome. You want things, and it comes from a place of love. I'm not saying that. You want your kids to end up a certain way, or grandkids. Some of you grandparents need to cool off. You have a desired outcome, so you try to control it. You try to lead it in that you need to, and you push it that way. And, and if you try to enter into this world with a sense of control that I am strong enough, with my righteous right hand, I will control the outcome over here. Oh, it's going to be a tough road. You're going to feel so much fear. You're going to feel a burden, or as Jesus says, you'll be heavy laden. That's a good church word, right? It'll be heavy. Right? In the new reality, Jesus says, how about I'll be God and you trust me? You abide in me and I'll abide in you and you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who is burdened and heavy laden, come to me. I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. The byproduct of the new reality is a life of peace. Promise to you, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I don't give to you as the world gives. What does the world give? Fear. Fear. The world even markets to you products based on fear. If I, can, if I can get you afraid, I can make you make a lot of really wonky decisions. We just went through years of feeling afraid, baseline fear. 
What's going to happen? What about my kids? What about my family? What about my job? What about the economy? What about, what about, what about, what if, what if, what if, what if? And Jesus is like, get over here, man. I'm not confused. I am sovereign. I'm in control. Nothing will happen in your life beyond my gaze. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Trust me. There's one example that stands out in my mind. And I think as parents, if you're a parent, you'll, you'll attach to this. I remember this feeling when my daughter was born as a father where you so badly don't want anything of this broken world to impact them. Like if I could bubble wrap my precious little girl's heart, I would. Just to keep her away from all of the perversion and the crud of this world. I mean, I keep telling her don't trust boys, so hopefully that sinks in. She doesn't get to date till she's 40. I see the landscape of you boys. There might be some good ones out there. If I believe in maybe let's do an arranged thing, right? But like that is, it freaks me out as parents. Anyone else? A little bit? A little bit? It's a wonky world. They can hardly go to school without fearing they're going to, are they coming home? You can ignore it, but it's in there as a parent. And I remember having this real fear. Like maybe we should like homeschool or maybe like let's just keep her, I don't know. And, and I, I remember that. I mean, it was, it was welling up on me. It was Isaiah 41 that, 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 that God used to broke, break me out of that, to get me unstuck. And I remember this feeling overwhelming feeling as I was reading Isaiah 41. And God, as I was reading, he like turned it. And the focus was on my little girl. And all of a sudden, I just read it differently. And I said, I have chosen her. I have not cast her off. Fear not. I am with her. Don't be dismayed. I am her God. I will strengthen her. I will help her. I will uphold her with my righteous right hand. And it just flipped. When all of a sudden I was like, oh, you're not calling me to be Superman. You're calling me to be faithful. You're not calling me to just keep her earthly safe. Like, is my job protect? Yes, I get all that. But there's so many things out of my control. And I know my life, I've had my own pain, my own suffering. Why do I think she's going to escape that? But the thing that won't change is there is a God who loves her more than I love her. A God who loves my family and the same goes for each of you. There is a God whose power far exceeds anything you could imagine and that God is for you. And it doesn't mean you won't have suffering. It doesn't mean everything's going to go squeaky in your life. What it does mean is that nothing will separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Meaning, no matter what happens in this world, you will end up with Jesus. I cannot control if I get cancer, get in a car accident, something goes wrong, something this, something that. I can't control any of that. But what I can do is have faith that no matter what happens in my life, Jesus wins. Tomb empty. I don't know. It did something in my life. I'm not saying I don't like fear it from time to time, but it was starting to get like, because what was happening is fear always steals. Because it's a weapon of Satan. It'll steal. It steals from you. Steals your joy, steals your comfort, steals your peace. It affects you. It affects how you parent. It affects how you're married. It affects everything when you're motivated by fear because you're going to control weird things. You're going to, you're going to act in a strange manner as one who's not living in peace. It was stealing from me and Jesus encountered that fear. But you could be going through other things. You could have something going on with one of your kids or your spouse could be something psychological or an addiction or an illness. could be something going on at school or something with a job. or You could just be looking out at the world and like, whoa, chaos. The question is, what do we do with our fear? How do we combat that in our life? Well, I gave you my example, the Word. 
Every time you read the word, you're reading in this reality. The reality of the new kingdom, the reality of the power of Christ. That's the power of the word. Every time you pray, as Paul says in Philippians 4, if you're wondering about how do I get to that peace you're talking about, that sounds nice. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, through your prayers, your supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Here's the promise. As you do that, the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will be guarding your hearts and your minds in the promises and truth of Jesus Christ. Prayer is your gateway into that reality. You can pray your way through fear. It doesn't always eliminate the fear, but it reminds you that whatever you're afraid of is still a small spider. The power of prayer, the power of the Word of God, the power of a good friend or family member that you can just talk about it with. I'm here for you. Maybe you got something going on. Talk about it. You're probably not the first one. You won't be the last one to have that fear. But you don't want to keep it in the dark. Things fester in the dark. Because at the end of the day, the number one way you combat fear is you have got to shine light on it. Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. Notice what it says in Psalm 23. What is evil? Shadows. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear any evil. Shadows are scary in the dark. They look big and they look menacing. How do you get rid of a shadow? Blast it with light. How many times have you been maybe afraid of a shadow and you shine some light on it and you're like, oh my goodness, right? That's what I was afraid of? The same thing goes in this life. How do you shine light on the shadows of your fear? The Word. Prayer. Conversation. You drag your fear into the light so you can get a kingdom of God perspective on whatever it is you're afraid of. That's what a pastor can help with. You might have something going on and you're like, what is the biblical take on what I'm going through? Come and talk about it. Shoot me an email. Send me a text. Whatever it is, talk about it. Don't let it just fester. Because when it festers, it steals. It sabotages you. Don't do it. Jesus loves so deeply each and every one of you. He has chosen you. He's not cast you off. So I leave you again with Isaiah 41. Fear not. Jesus is with you. Don't be dismayed. He is your God. He will strengthen you. He will help you. He will uphold you with His righteous, nail-pierced hand. Go in his peace. Amen? Amen.